Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, which will be focusing on the importance of dark web monitoring with digital shadows. I'm Danielle Chapman. I work in the marketing team here at Bytes. Today, I'm joined by Michael Marriott, Senior Product Marketing Manager at Digital Shadows, who will be holding the webinar today. I'm also joined by Toby Noble, Cybersecurity Specialist at Bytes, who will briefly talk about the relationship between Digital Shadows and Bytes. Okay, so I'm now just going to pass you over to Toby. Thanks, Danielle, and good afternoon, everyone, and thanks very much for joining us. Um, so I'm not going to go into too much detail on this slide, um, but I did just want to flash it up so you can kind of have a look through while I speak to you for a moment. Um, but just to, to fill you in a bit on the Bytes security background and, and kind of where we've come in recent years, um, fortunately for us, Digital Shadows have been part of that journey and part of that growth. Um, and on the screen at the moment, you can see a whole host of different areas of security in which we are finding a lot of traction, a lot of growth, um, and very regular conversations with customers such as yourselves um, ongoing. Um, what I would say is if you did want to delve into any of these areas in particular after today, um, do feel free to reach out to myself um, or your Bytes account manager. And just one last bit from me, I suppose. Um, this is a very busy slide, so apologies in advance for that. Um, what I don't want to do is, is delve into too much detail on each solution, of course, but what I do want to highlight here is, I suppose this is how Bytes see the security landscape. These are the conversations we're having with our customers day in, day out. Um, of course, everyone on this call, I'm sure, knows security is no longer just about protecting your emails and your firewalls and your endpoints. It is so much more, as, as we all know. And, those areas on the left, I suppose, are all the areas that we're seeing massive growth, massive interest in, in the market and from, and from our customers as well. Of course, today we're here to hear from Digital Shadows, um, and they are about two thirds of the way down that list there under threat intel and digital risk. Um, now, the reason Bytes and Digital Shadows partner is because while we have some fantastic technologies in the area of uh, endpoint and network, for example, as you can see from the slide, a, a gap that wasn't being addressed um, was around digital risk and not looking internally within your organization, but actually looking at the big bad world of the dark web. And that's what we're here to hear uh, a lot more about today. So I'll stop rambling. And without further ado, I will pass over to Michael from Digital Shadows. Thank you very much. All right, thanks, Toby, for that, that glowing introduction. And I think that sets up really nicely to what I'm going to be talking about today. And as Toby mentioned, we're looking outside of the traditional network. And one of the questions that comes up a lot is, what's my profile on the dark web? Should I be concerned about that? What does it look like? Um, so we chat to a lot of people about what they can expect to find from the dark web and, and how that maps to actually their use cases. Is it just some shiny thing or, or should they be really concerned and how, how can they actually do stuff to action that and reduce their risk profile outside of their network. So uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about that and uh, dive into some trends and some examples and, and then even a bit of a, a live demo as well if we have time. I, I thought I'd start off just by uh, pulling a few headlines because I mean this is just in the past two weeks. Um, but it happens every single week. We see more and more stuff about the dark web. And it tends to be fairly drug centric. Uh, so lots of people in London ordering drugs um, from the dark web uh, because for various reasons, it's harder to get and it's a lot easier to get on the dark web. And then every single week, it seems there's more arrests that come from these dark web busts um, and particularly those that were involved in, in the drug trade. So. Although it gets loads of headlines and, and occasionally uh, kind of a cybersecurity related story in there, it can be a bit confusing to work out right, what does the dark web actually mean to us. So I'm going to try and dispel that throughout this session. So first of all, I, I know it's a little bit of a cliche to start off with definitions, but it is important to talk about what actually the dark web is uh, before moving on to some of the interesting trends that we're seeing in, in 2020 at the, the end of 2019 as well. Um, I'll then talk about how that maps to specific use cases that we find the organizations we're working with are interested in, and then show some stuff in action and, and some free tools uh, to finish off with, because I know everybody likes some free stuff uh, to get started with. 
So definitions, how many times have, have people seen uh, the dreaded iceberg? So you've got you know, a little bit of the, the clear web at the top, the iceberg, but underneath you've got the deep web and the dark web and there's a huge mass of information uh, that we just can't see. Um, that I see a lot. It's not a particularly useful analogy because um, it suggests that the dark web is bigger than everything else uh, and I think it unnecessarily obscures what we mean from the dark web. So actually I think it's a better way of looking at it. Um, if you think about the surface web, anything that's indexed by traditional search engines and you can access that by any browser, say so Google Chrome, Safari, whatnot. Uh, the deep web is, is not indexed by traditional search engines. It's, it's behind a gated site and need to log into it or something like that. And then the dark web is, is a section of the deep web, but it's only accessible through specific software. And Tor, so that .onion, TLD, and I2P are, are the most popular of those. So often what you'll find is people, when they talk about dark web, actually just mean something that's, that's a bit bad outside their network and, and they want visibility into it. Uh, in fact, when you actually dig into it, there are four areas that people actually mean by, by dark web. In my experience, you've got dark web marketplaces, and we'll be talking about those today, a uh, very specific model of selling goods online. You've got then criminal forums, which aren't generally hosted on uh, Tor or I2P, um, but they're on those gated sites. Uh, a trend that we've seen, and again, I'll talk about this, is the messaging P2P networks. So you've got things like Telegram, ICQ, you've got also IRC channels. They are still used by cyber criminals today. And then you've got you've got paste sites, so things that you know, really aren't dark web at all, but they've got stuff on there that is relevant to organizations, and they've got various, like you've got Pastebin, but also the various brothers and sisters of Pastebin, like Pasty, Ghostbin, and, and different locations where people may be sharing customer details, um, or doxes of individuals, or anything they can just be a little bit anonymous with. So generally, like, it's, when we chat to people, dark web generally means somewhere beyond their typical viewpoint, and they, they want that that visibility uh, that they don't have within the network. And actually, when, when we chat to people, and I, I can't go into everything today, but there's more than just the dark web. I mean, they're interested in social media, GitHub, S3 buckets, new domains, Shodan, uh, even news and blogs. So there's an awful lot of information out there that doesn't necessarily fall specifically on the dark web, but getting this visibility on all of this and where criminality happens online uh, is a real area of interest to organizations. So I won't talk any more about definition of the dark web because I know not everybody's into definitions, but I think just having that level set of what actually is the dark web is, is pretty important to understand uh, as a foundational piece. So the, the more interesting stuff, at least I think, is the, the recent trends that, that we've seen. And I've distributed this into a few of those different types of dark web locations. And the first one is, is absolutely marketplaces. And that's quite a specific model. Um, if, if you remember back to 2017, uh, Alpha Bay was all the rage. Uh, and for good reason, I had a, an enormous amount of vendors and customers on there. And specifically, they were going for, this is the founder of the site, some of the largest eBay, eBay style underground market you know, ever created. And it really specifically hosted on dark web and they, they created it like eBay to make transactions really easy, really user friendly. And they could just uh, go through loads of transactions each day. And Alpha Bay was the absolute glowing example of this. So it's continually innovating. Uh, having all the latest cryptocurrencies in there. They even added a credit card shop in there. They had tens of thousands of vendors, hundreds of thousands of people buying goods on there. And I think at the time that the uh, creator was arrested, they'd gone through over $1 billion in transactions. So incredibly successful site that was being created and lots of the headlines at the time that came out were around these big data breaches uh, Facebook, MySpace, uh, that were being sold on Alphabay and different 
variations thereon. Unfortunately, uh, well, at least unfortunately for the Alpha Bay founders, is that um, the US and Dutch law enforcement got, got very interested in the drug sale, and particularly with fentanyl, uh, it became a real issue for for law enforcement. So all of a sudden, you know, laser eyes on these marketplaces, and it, it wasn't long before they were really in the crosshairs and they were being taken down. And uh, some of you will be familiar with this, but really cool pincer story uh, when they managed to arrest the founder with all of his laptops open, they got control over Alphabet. But they got in touch with their Dutch colleagues and said, well, you know, we've, we've got this really big arrest um, and we've got access to Alphabet and that's amazing. Um, so they did that, but, and then the Dutch police told them, well, actually, we've got control of Hansa, which is the second biggest one. And so they're able to not release the announcement at the same time. So Alpha Bay went first, said that, you know, we've, we've taken down this site, it's been seized, they had this notification on the, uh, the marketplace itself. And so everybody just freaks out and they don't know what to do because they need to sell their goods, they need to buy their drugs, they need to sell different accounts and whatnot. And so they just flock to Hansa, unbeknownst that, um, that actually, that's now under control of law enforcement. So you can see this is actually taken from wired.com, but new users on Hansa, you can see it's fairly steady until Alphabet is taken down. Huge peak in registrations. Uh, they even, even law enforcement running the site can't deal with the amount of people that are signing up. So then they disable registration, which convinces the cyber criminals even more for reopening it and even more people sign up. So they're just getting more and more details uh, of all of these vendors and users, which have created so many arrests uh, that we see today. In fact, there was even a, a cool story that they sent an email to all the vendors apologizing that they had uh, deleted all of the photos of the products that they were trying to sell. And they said, oh, very sorry, we've had a database hiccup and you'll need to re-upload these, these photos of your goods. And so they did it, but um, normally Hansa was taking out all the metadata, uh, but they, they didn't offer that service anymore because they were law enforcement and they got all of these photos uh, with generally left to people's locations, which led to even more arrests. So Alpha Bay and Hansa taken down and it was an absolute law enforcement mastermind uh, and the ramifications are still seen today. So that was back in 2017. And since then there's been uh, various different marketplaces popping up, different alternative mechanisms being introduced to try and regain that trust of customers because it, it really took a bit of a hammering. Um, but although there have been many different marketplace takedowns before, I think it had always been a, a case of whack-a-mole and there weren't that many that actually, any takedowns that had that much of a lasting impact, I should say. Um, but 2019 uh, continued to be an absolute disaster for dark web marketplaces. Um, you had Dream Market, which shut down that you can see there. Um, just, just too much of them with the law enforcement view. Even Market.ms, which was run by some really reputable uh, cyber criminals, uh, they just struggled to make money they needed to, to make it reasonable. Um, but there's been so many others. Deep Dark Web was sort of a, a Reddit for getting everything you need on uh, dark web marketplaces, but there's been so many takedowns, uh, it's hard to keep track of sometimes. One here you see was a particularly interesting instance of uh, the Olympus market, um, which looked at the time to be the one that was gonna take over from Alpha Bay eventually in the middle of 2019. Um, and unfortunately they got a little bit cocky um, so they, they said, ah, oh, there's a dark web individual called uh, Hugbunter, who isn't particularly liked by a few marketplaces because he does unsolicited pen testing for their marketplaces. And Olympus, as they were consolidating their market share, thought it would be amazing if they could uh, just announce to everybody that they're hacking uh, his forum, which is known as Dread. So they, they had this big announcement they had. Turns out lots of honor amongst thieves. Um, and instead of people thinking that was cool, everybody was, was just like, yeah, that, that's not cool. Um, he, he's one of us. So uh, everybody just abandoned the Olympus forum and had, that was no more. So kind of the nail in, in the coffin for a lot of the sites, um, but 
still some remain and there's some really interesting uh, stuff on there and I'll get onto that later in the presentation. But here's what it looks like now. Uh, you've got uh, a fairly even distribution across the top three or four and then some smaller ones there as well. You've got Nightmare Market, Berlusconi, Empire Market, uh, Dark Market as well, which is uh, interesting for a few reasons. Uh, but then you've got a, a smattering of other ones uh, that we're monitoring. Uh, but yeah, our closed sources team always looking at these these developments, ensuring that our coverage maps what the threat landscape is, uh, so that we're, we're covering the latest and greatest, and we know where the actors are and um, where they're likely to be trading these goods. I mentioned dark market there, and that's something that I've never seen before. I think it's fairly unique because um, it's branded as the first ever female-run marketplace. So there is some progressive elements to uh, dark web underworld. Um, and I think definitely these marketplaces are using anything they can to differentiate and whether or not it is actually the first female run marketplace um, maybe isn't relevant as long as they've got that, that, that hook in which to entice people. But that's one of the ones that's, that's a fairly interesting uh, place where people are selling different goods uh, at the moment. So like one of the big effects of the, all these marketplaces having the disruption has been that people got a lot more jittery about discussing criminality in the open and on these marketplaces. So in the in the immediate aftermath of all of these events, you found that people were moving to discuss these things on Telegram or Discord or um, on a Java conversation where people are a lot more comfortable discussing the uh, precise details of the transactions themselves. Uh, this is a methodology that's always been used by the Russian speaking underground. Um, they will kind of advertise something a bit vaguely on a forum and then they'll move over to a, a Jabba chat to actually thrash out the specific details. But what you found is this was becoming a lot more common particularly with the English speaking community. They were as I say a lot more jittery and wanting to transact on these different locations. So we saw a massive uptick in uh, the amount of links shared to Telegram, either personal rooms or bigger groups. So, I mean, that led us to add in uh, Telegram as a source that we cover in 2017. Um, and there's some really interesting stuff in there. You know, you've got people selling credit card details, gift cards. And this is just one selection of rooms. There's even a dedicated marketplace that is that lives on Telegram, uh, a lib. Uh, which you can just quite intuitively choose whether you want to buy airline flights, you want to you want to buy drugs, uh, you maybe you want to buy get like an Uber credit, uh, or you want some electronic goods. Uh, and this is a really good way of doing that, and you don't even need to interact with anybody. Uh, you can just tap these buttons. Um, indeed, if it's one thing that uh, Russian cyber criminals love, it's a it's a chatbot. Uh, so yeah, lots of innovation happening on. Telegram uh, and Jabber's kind of the same as it has always been. But that led a lot of people to speculate that everybody's kind of gone onto the underground now. Everybody's hiding away. Nobody's going to be in plain sight. And there were challenges for intelligence companies because how do we get that intelligence if they're, if they're just on these, these closed peer-to-peer -peer networks? But what actually, we, we wrote a paper on this a couple of weeks back so I can share that with anybody that's interested. But what we've noticed is that the criminal forum isn't as sexy as any of these things. It, it doesn't have the nice UI of the admin uh, chatbot where you can buy stuff. Uh, it's not the eBay lovely UX that we saw of Alpha Bay or of uh, Olympus Market or of any of the dark web marketplaces. You haven't got these automatic transactions and the mixing of cryptocurrencies and all the cool functionality however despite all of that it's it's the criminal forums that aren't on the dark web most of the time they may have mirrors on there it's those ones that are really really enduring it's a model that's been around for 20 plus years and it's trusted by the community uh, it may look horrible it may look like it's a website from the 1990s uh, generally it is it's got horrible technology behind it but it's it's what works and instead of criminality not happening 
uh, with all of these takedowns and the focus on them. What's happened is that they've just reverted to the mechanisms that always worked before. So that is criminal forums. Um, they're not immune. I mean, there has been stuff in the news uh, in fraud forum, uh, particularly with the FBI and indictments against a host of individuals. They've managed to seize a few. They've, as I say, there's been a few indictments as well. Um, so staff are saying they're not immune and they're still a little bit of the focus, but there's so many of them, it, it becomes hard to focus on all. Um, so as, as a way of just outlining kind of where they've come from. I think this is a quite a nice diagram for doing that um, because a lot of the actors have been right from the first pantheon forums um, and they, they've gone through different ones to where they are today. And I think it's quite useful to have this in your head. So back, back in the day in the uh, 1990s to the early 2000s, you've got the first forums that really came about. And some of those still live and kicking today you've got you'll notice exploit there that's a that's a huge source of intelligence and uh, I'll, I'll show some stuff later on here but there's also um anti chat Troy uh, and then a few of the others which are no longer in existence but were were big at that time that you can see with the asterisks on them that then um evolved in in the 2000s so out of those communities the new communities uh, stealth division shadow crew dark Ode, Hack for um, all of those merge, uh, which are, are no longer in existence, which bred to the, to the new ones in just before 2017. Hack forums, uh, many of you will be familiar with that. Raid forums, uh, still active today, um, and then a few that aren't. Kickass, which started off as an insider trading forum. Uh, Zero day, which kind of does what it says on the tin, and hell as well. So as well as all those that are still in existence. The new post-17 world, 2017 world, uh, we've got Tarum, which we see a lot of cool stuff on. Uh, we've got Dread, which if you remember that example of Olympus Forum and Hogbunter, that's one that Hogbunter's running. Um, XSS is another huge one as well. So these are some of the really highly vetted communities that can be difficult to get into, uh, but have some really valuable intelligence in there. So um, yeah, keep 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 note of these names because they'll be very useful uh, if you if you start your own or do do your own uh, intelligence gathering on these um, underground forums. So just to, just to demonstrate, I've, I've banged on about how forums are really popular, um, but without really any evidence behind it. So I thought I should probably put some evidence in here. Um, and just to have some of the latest uh, big actors here and just to show how much the growth that we're seeing in these these locations. So Karoom, um, a lot of the really interesting stuff that I see come up from our closed sources team comes from Karoom. And I'll, I'll probably show you an example of that uh, after the slides here. Um, but you've got uh, back in February 2019, about 6,000 members. Now, when we looked, when we did this piece of analysis, uh, nearly 44,000 members, which is an incredible growth. That's a lot of people. Um, yeah, Alpha Bay had like 40,000 uh, vendors on there, as you saw before. I mean, but 40,000 members, that, that's an awful lot. And then the post, uh, similarly, unexpectedly, um, going up from 6,000 to 61,000 there too. So lots more activity, lots to be monitoring, lots more that we can ingest and make relevant to our clients who are interested in, in getting these too. Similar story for other forums, XSS, uh, not as explosive growth, uh, but we're seeing from Feb to 20, Feb to November in 2019, we're seeing almost a doubling of membership um, and a, a big increase in forum posts too. So XSS also growing a big area of closed source coverage for digital shadows. And then finally, that one that was in the first pantheon, exploit.in, uh, continues to be a leader in the Cyber criminal underworld. Um, you know they've already got lots of members, and that doesn't show any signs of slowing down. In fact, the only way that membership slows down on these kind of sites, uh, such as with Verified and Exploit, um, a Verified being another forum, is because they limit it. They gain too many people. They can't vouch for the identities of their new members, and so they have to 
charge a fee, do tests, gain, uh, so on and so forth. So lots going on there. And I really like exploit because there's a lot of um, innovation that comes out of it, I guess. Um, and one of those is the Genesis market. So I don't know whether anybody's on is in a, in a fraud role uh, or acts with the fraud team as part of the, the security setup at your organization. But I'm not an expert on, expert on fraud, but I think it's very interesting. And um, my kind of dummy's guide to fraud uh, practices is that you, in order to identify a fraudulent transaction on a website, use various different attributes of the, uh, the individual that's trying to make the purchase. So it could be the browser information, it could be the cookies, it could be um, their location, their IP address, all of these things help to give an idea of the footprinting or the fingerprinting of uh, that particular transaction. If it appears that that fingerprint is suspicious uh, or if it's not coming from a location that you would expect, then that transaction can be declined and you can avoid those costs of fraud. So what exploit are doing, um, that noticing that there are these anti-fingerprinting uh, technologies uh, to detect those fraudulent transactions, they created the Genesis market which uh, is a Chrome plugin uh, based on a marketplace where instead of when you do a, when you're trying to use a stolen credit card, you will have to kind of buy, you have to route the traffic through an IP address which is close to the location of the person that owns the credit card. You'll have to rotate proxies. You'll have to try and um, like clear your cash, make sure you don't have any cookies that could lead you elsewhere. And it can be quite tricky. Um, and there's lots of guides online that, that speak about this. So instead, what uh, Genesis Market does, uh, which has been growing quite a bit, uh, is you can just rent an entire identity. So this one here, uh, Spanish uh, fingerprint, and you you rent it for a day, and it's got all of the logons already. It's got Facebook credit card information on there. Um, it's got all of these automatically harvested credentials but it also takes in all of their cookies, uh, all of the browser information, and it perfectly imitates that user. So um, when we look across these, you see quite a few kind of company names that you'd recognize that they've got access to through these accounts. But the first time I've seen such a innovative approach to um, fingerprinting, and there's a, a few different sites that have emerged copying Genesis since because of the success that it's had. So that's just one example of the, the type of innovation that comes out of export.in. Got some very innovative um, founders and lots more that we could talk about, but potentially don't have time in the session. But I, I'm quite interested by the innovations that come out of these, these types of forums. Now, as I mentioned, I, I, can, I can talk a lot about the uh, trends in dark web underworld criminality I, I think it's really interesting and the way that there's different infighting and the techniques they use to gain all of this trust and, and stuff like that um, but is it how relevant is that to you as a security professional and this is the conversation that we need to have with people like yes dark web's really interesting we've got lots of criminality happening but why should you care about it and i think that's really important to, to talk about because if you're just looking at something because it's cool but it's not actionable, then you're, you're kind of wasting your time and your money. Yes, it's interesting, but, but what are you actually doing? So we've been working with a lot of companies who have been at this for a few years now. And uh, I think now it's sort of crystallized into why people cover these sources. Um, and for me, it falls into these three areas. So firstly, they want to be detecting external threats and specifically phishing campaigns uh, higher up in the, in the kill chain. So they want to be looking at phishing kits, uh, what's going on there, people targeting them, uh, as well as a few other areas, whether there's um, named on target lists, um, people asking for access to their network, so on and so forth. I mean, that's, that's the main area, and people are very interested to get that, that prior warning and, and make some decisions based on that. We see a lot to do with fraud uh, and hacked customer accounts. So it could be, depending on your company, if you're a retailer, it could be counterfeit goods being sold on these marketplaces. It could be customer accounts if you're in the technology space. Um, but obviously, an incredible amount of fraud with that goes on. And I think if they can gain the visibility that people are selling at customer accounts, 
uh, they can actually do something about that and uh, make some actions to to reduce fraud and, and save money on the bottom line. And then thirdly, breach employee credentials. That's a really tangible use case. If you've got employees that are using their password and uh, corporate emails uh, to sign up for other sites, that really leaves the company exposed. So being able to get those as soon as they crop up um, and then work out whether they're similar to the actual organization's policies and then reset them if necessary. Um, yeah, there's a huge trade in these. Uh, so many stories about uh, what they're up to uh, and all of these sources that we've come across today, um, there's a big trade in credentials there. But these three tend to be uh, the biggest areas. We did some recent, this is, this is hot off the press, um, so you're very lucky for people that are uh, <laughs> watching this. We did some recent analysis of the average price of a phishing advert, and we've done this by company. So you've got eBay, cheapers, Facebook, Amazon, uh, it's most expensive if you want to uh, buy a phishing advert uh, across all of these criminal forums. And uh, over, over the past two and a half years, uh, if you're looking to buy a phishing template, um, banks obviously, unsurprisingly, are the the most valuable, and they cost the most. So you can you can hire somebody to create a perfect clone of a bank's customer login portal, and then you can register that that domain and just upload the template and send that as part of um, phishing campaigns and and dupe customers, or indeed, uh, in many of these cases, employees into providing their emails. Um, so, but obviously. If anybody you work in uh, email security or you're involved in uh, uh, responding to phishing attempts, I think the fact that you've got email spoofs, um, people clicking on links that go to a, a fake Outlook or Gmail login, that's incredibly common and they're pretty to a penny to pick up. So really reasonable uh, to get these phishing templates. If you can actually uh, download them, uh, you can get an idea of what they're what they're actually spoofing and the difficulties in fact that they have with doing so so um what, what they're failing to imitate and then kind of doubling down on that is, is something that we've seen organizations doing um specifically on dark web marketplaces we did some topic modeling for what's being sold there and um, because often as i mentioned lots of drugs and pornography tend to be sold there but what's actually relevant for security professionals. Um, you've got lots of carding guides, so if you're, if you're a bank or a retailer and you want to know how people are using stolen credit cards through your um, your platform, then this is a good way to see the latest uh, piece of advice they're giving. The grey box there, accounts, customer accounts, as I said, a huge area for uh, lots of criminals and indeed security professionals. And then particularly for retailers, we see lots of gift cards being traded, big databases, and uh, even malware being traded too. So I think hopefully this is a, a useful diagram of, of where we see the most stuff being traded. And then we did recently went through just in a month what we would see from exploit.in and verified, because they're kind of quite different things you might see. So instead of those more customer accounts and fraud related. On these closed forums, uh, you tend to get a lot more accesses. So access to servers, databases, um, botnet logs, uh, RDP servers, having all access to these um, tends to be what is of most interest to these particular forums. And uh, I want to show you in a little bit how that manifests itself because that tends to be quite a high priority for uh, organizations. Obviously, if there's a, a server that somebody claims to have access to, uh, you want to be aware of that. Cool. And then finally, credentials. Um, they they come up all the time. Uh, our team are constantly finding them, adding into our repository, which I think is 14 billion uh, and growing. But they come up on criminal forums, on these marketplaces, on pace sites, even on technical sites like GitHub. I mentioned this at the beginning, and that's a really important site, particularly if you've got API credentials um, that a developer is accidentally uploading. You want to be knowing about that because that just makes it so easy for attackers. But also, they're, they're trading these, these bulk loads of credentials on private channels as well. So getting a view of their tech can also be very important. 
Now, I thought it would be useful to see some of this in action if we've got time. So I'll, I'll just do that and then I'll finish on it um, before making conclusions and then handing back for some, some Q&A. So if I just change to the portal here. So see, this is the Digital Shadow Searchlight portal and we're basically looking for an organization's assets where they're exposed uh, whether that is on the dark web, criminal forums, GitHub, uh, anywhere that may be online. So here you can see a host of different um, advert, um, incidents uh, that we're, uh, our team is alerting people to. So this one, Ted Malfa Bay, um, you've got somebody advertising for technical skills, but it gets a little bit more specific as well. You've got people selling specific company accounts. So here we go, you go your corporate accounts being advertised on on criminal forums, so you can get the snippet here, you can view the thread, see the actors. Our Russian linguist will translate it for you, so you can see actually what it means and what they're talking about. And you can actually get the impact and recommended action there, as well as pivoting into any finished threat intel profiles. That's really useful for organizations, and we have that specific uh, dedicated thing related to their assets, really, really relevant, as well as looking at the broader threat landscape, what's going on? What are all of these innovations that are happening? Where are people transacting? What are the new services being offered? Uh, we should see the intelligence incidents here. So uh, continually updated by our team. Say for example, if this individual getting access to a Ukrainian bank. Um, so when I talked about Tarub and the forum here, this would be an example of it. Um, the types of things that will come up as a result. This is something that's being found by our closed sources team when they're looking across these sources. Uh, if you're in, if you're operating in that region, uh, you're running financial services, you're probably interested in this actor. So we also provide the ability to to highlight that and dig into these live raw sources of intelligence. So you can see here's our finished intelligence. But underneath here, you can see this actor on Tarum, not just with this Ukrainian bank, but all of the activity that they've been up to. So yeah, as well as sort of the managed service offering, we've also got this, this really cool search capability. So if I go on export Diane, which I think is kind of the leading one, and I want to know everybody's selling access, I can pull back that result and get back anybody talking about selling access on exploit.hen. So you can see 441 posts that we've got, people selling access to personal laptops, uh, energy companies, so on and so forth. So lots of incredible intelligence you can go there that we're looking on behalf of our clients, but if people want to be looking at what like third party assessments or they're doing going through a merger and acquisition, this could be really useful context uh, to have. There's also things like, I talked about phishing, phishing pages. Um, you can see everybody transacting on those, targeting different companies uh, that they can then trade. So what you've got thousands of results across all of these different sources for people looking at these different mission pages. So that's kind of the, the dark way of things. Uh, and then we don't just stop there. As I mentioned, we go a lot broader than that. So for example, with phishing, not only we'd want to be finding the phishing page itself, but when that domain gets registered, we do things like pick up typo squats and impersonating domains. Um, so you've got an alert here, um, which has got a domain that looks really, really similar. It's just the typo squat. Um, and it comes with uh, a screenshot of the page itself. It got historical who is information. Does it have a DNS record, an MX record? Uh, what's the reputation data on it? Has it been flagged on WebRoot or Google WebRisk? Um, and then you've got all of that who is and DNS records too. And then from that, we enable organizations to do things like launch takedowns um, and, and we give them quite detailed playbooks um, for actually dealing with these risks. So instead of just waiting until it gets to the email gateway, uh, we're providing all that visibility before uh, you know, anything even gets created and people are sharing phishing pages. And then when that impersonating domain, as soon as it gets registered and it's got these risk factors involved, we'll, alert that to you and provide you ways of remediating it. So yeah, 
that's that's just one example of alert. There's many others, whether it's border minutes exposed on a misconfigured FTP server, whether it's API credentials being exposed on GitHub, um, whether it's a contractor that's exposing a pen test that they've done of you. These are all things we, we see pretty commonly. Um, and there's a good way of getting that visibility outside the network, as Toby said right at the beginning, uh, getting that visibility and actually doing things to reduce your attack surface um, so that you're not just, I hate the phrase, but not low-hanging fruit. Uh, you don't have all of these exposed customer credentials or these domains that are being registered without your view. All of these things, I think, are easy ways that you can just go and do something that lowers your risk profile and has a huge impact um, on actually just making your company more secure. So I will just hop back into this um, and just, just wrap up really, because I want to allow enough time for questions uh, and, and hand back uh, to the team at Byte. So three takeaways um, that I want everybody to just be aware of. So first of all, uh, you've got the fact that the criminal underground is always in a state of flux. Um, there's constantly things happening, law enforcement, infighting, uh, new stuff crops up, um, but it always bounces back no matter what happens, uh, particularly that, that forum model. Um, dark web has a lot of different definitions. Uh, I think that confuses a lot of things sometimes. Hopefully people are aware of what it actually means now and where some useful stuff is uh, online. And then the fact that you actually need to focus on these use cases. Don't just do it because it's the dark web. Uh, do it because there are specific use cases that are relevant to your company that can actually help to reduce your risk profile. And then finally, um, just some free stuff uh, that if people aren't aware of, they should be already. Um, appreciate that not everybody can be in a position where they can invest in these things, um, as valuable as it is. So having things like, have I been pwned? which is a free tool for looking at your corporate exposed email addresses. So entering in your company domain there um, on the pro version or indeed your, your own personal email on the free version uh, is, a, is a good way to go about understanding the credential exposure there. Um, so if you're not aware of that, you should be, take note of that. Um, I mentioned our free white paper. Um, so about the criminal forums, I just had a few nuggets in this presentation, but this paper, if you are interested in looking at more of these trends, uh, which I find interesting, you can you can download a copy of this paper, um, uh, which we've made available to everybody. Uh, I think that's just freely available. You don't need to put any details or anything like that. So feel free, fill your boots. And then finally, uh, we, we can, you can actually go and uh, register for tests and, and do some searches of your own, like I just did in Shadow Search and, and see what it's all about. So uh, that's all I had. I will stop sharing now uh, and just allow any time for questions if they crop up. So thanks, everybody. OK, thank you, Michael. Um, I'd now like to open it up to any questions. So if you do have any questions, please just submit them in the questions box, which is at the right hand side of your screen on the control panel. I'll give it a couple of secs so uh, you can get your questions in. Thank you. Okay, so how prominently are you seeing UK businesses on the dark web? Yeah, um, it's pretty common um, for UK. Um, it's a big area. We see a lot of, first of all, there's a lot of vendors uh, that are from uh, the UK. There's a, uh, an actor selling a lot of accounts called Gnostic Players um, that we suspect is UK based. Um, and indeed, a lot of the the databases that this act is selling are for UK-based companies as well. Um, I'd say more than oh, just under half of the companies that we work with are based in the UK. Um, I mean, we've got a big client base there, and, and yeah, there's, there's a lot goes on. It sort of depends on your industry as well. So, there's, if you're a retailer based in the UK, there's there's a lot. Uh, of stuff on dark web marketplaces. Obviously, if you're a bank as well, that tends to attract a lot of attention. Uh, but yeah, I, I think the UK is up there with 
bigger um, presences that we see. Okay, brilliant. Thanks, Michael. And how is the product priced or licensed? Uh, yeah, so it's on a on an annual reoccurring basis. Um, so you've got a, a set fee, it's a managed service, um, and it lasts for a year. Unlimited assets, you register as many as you want, unlimited users, uh, and you get access to all of these sources and identify all of these risks uh, that are out there. So uh, just one fee based on the size of the organisation and number of employees, uh, and that will get you an annual subscription for a year. Thank you very much. So also, um, I've had another question from someone. If I understood correctly on the triage tab, would it, we, sorry, we would see only alerts for assets related to us, domains, IPs, et cetera. And if so, is it priced by asset? Um, so two parts of that question. First one, yeah, absolutely correct. So that triage screen is just those that are specific to the assets that the company's registered with us. So that's our way of making it relevant and kind of our unique spin on threat intelligence where it's not just generic threats, it's really specific to that organization and that's what we're all about. Um, but because that's what we're all about, we don't charge per asset because we think that's a silly way to do it and it uh, would discourage people from making it relevant to their company. So actually we encourage as many assets as possible. We don't have that as part of the pricing model because we believe that it should inherently be made as relevant as possible. So uh, no, uh, you can register as many assets as possible and indeed it is encouraged. Um, so for example, if you, if you just register one domain, uh, your company email domain, you'll get exposed employee credentials, uh, you'll get certificate issues from the infrastructure side of things, you'll get people mentioning your, uh, so if they've got like phishing kits for your, um, your domain, you'll get spoofs of that domain, and that's all just from one asset. And typically we'll have people registering thousands of assets um, and we absolutely wouldn't want to limit that. But it's a good question. Brilliant, thank you, Michael. Um, so also which industries are at most risk? Yeah, each industry has, has obviously a slightly different risk profile. Um, I mentioned banks, so banks for phishing sites. Um, obviously the lure of having um, customer accounts being harvested is quite appealing so having phishing sites set up for banks is incredibly common as well as trading in banking trojans and malware that that's a big area so we work with a lot of banks who are interested in that and kind of making sure that they're on top of these things and they're reacting as soon as possible and reducing the risks of that happening uh, one bank we work with uh, i think within a domain was registered in the morning uh, we didn't that didn't reach our threshold for alerting because it didn't have any of the risk attributes we then re-alerted when we got mx records and dns records um they were then able to take they were able to launch a takedown and, and by early afternoon before the phishing campaign had even started uh, they had removed that domain so it was a huge area and a huge win for that particular bank so banks that's a big one retailers um uh, that's also a big one so people selling particularly things like customer gift cards, customer accounts, um, that, that's quite a specific risk profile there. And obviously you've seen all the major cart stuff that, that's happened in the last six months uh, or a year. So big one for retailers, but there are other things like more, slightly more niche industries, like we work with a lot with insurance and asset management companies um, who are really interested. If there's anything outside their network that's proprietary, sensitive, they're really interested in getting their hands on that and making sure um, that they are familiar with it and can take some action to remediate the risk. Uh, so if you think about like, any board minutes or M&A activity, um, they are particularly sensitive to that because they have big financial impacts. And then finally, uh, technology companies. Uh, we see, see a huge growth in technology companies, um, particularly those that are developing their own software. So. Uh, technical leakage on GitHub and Stack Overflow are, are big areas that people are interested in. Their developers are sharing proprietary code. If they've got API keys, clear text passwords, these are all things we see, see time and time again. Um, so if you're interested in that, do you get in touch? But also technology companies have these big, big growing brands that they're interested in protecting. And there's that interesting crossover between security and, and the world of brand um, that we, we have kind of like a foot on either side of which, which can be useful. But I think off my head, those would be the top ones, um, but sort of depends on the organization to organization really.
Brilliant, thank you again, Michael. So um, that's all the questions that we have for today. Uh, thanks so much for the time, to, for, sorry, for taking the time out of your day to join the webinar. I hope you found it val valuable and um, thanks to Michael and Toby for presenting. As I said earlier, if you've got time, could you please just complete the feedback form at the end and I'll send you a link to the recording tomorrow. Thank you again and have a lovely afternoon. Thank you. Bye.